This morning, I'm very happy. This is one of our two scheduled med medical education grand rounds, and we're really excited to have Dr. Bronwyn Bryant um, from Vermont um, to come and talk to us today. Uh, Bronwyn is an assistant professor of pathology, and she's the associate director of the residency training program there. And she did her, she went to Brown, she's um, basically a New Englander, yay. And she, um, she also went to medical school at Rochester and then went all the way across the country to the University of Washington for her APCP residency. And then went back again halfway, or a little more than halfway to Michigan for fellowship training in surgical pathology and GYN pathology. And then went back to Vermont, or to Vermont, where she joined the faculty and quite quickly became the associate program director. I heard about her virtually first from the program director, um, Scott Anderson, because he and I were on at the Milestones 2.0 committee together. And I was talking about EPAs and he said, oh, we have a faculty member who's actually trying out the EPAs in surgical pathology. And I said, really? This is exciting. Somebody's doing something. So then um, I actually met Brahman in person because we were both as part, part of the working group on EPAs for the Association of Pathology Chairs. So I immediately asked her if she could come and tell us some of her experiences. So she's going to talk to us today about entrustable professional activities and how she has used them or is using them in graduate medical education. So Dr. Bryant. Thank you. So I want to make sure that my voice carries. Um, can you hear me all in the back of the room? Because I'm going to be moving around and also asking you to speak a little bit as we go through, through this. So I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come and talk about what I think is a really great um, opportunity to, that we have moving forward in graduate medical education. So I added quickly, I have nothing to disclose besides working on the EPA working group with Debbie and being very invested in moving forward with these in graduate education. So I want to start with a couple of sort of questions for thought for all of you. To our residents, have you ever felt uncertain about what was expected of you on a particular rotation? Have you ever gotten, how often have you, are you getting clear, specific feedback that you can actually act on and make changes in your practice? Have you ever gotten non-specific feedback? <laughs> For the faculty, have you ever felt that the trainee wasn't quite meeting the rotation expectations um, or ever had a gut feeling about their performance and didn't quite know how to give them feedback about it? So I think that these are um, challenges that many different programs face and um, EPAs are going to be a way to help us address those. So first of all, our goal for today, we're going <laughs> to define EPAs. Um, I'm going to describe how they can support pathology resi resident education, and we're going to move through some fictional scenarios, and I'll emphasize these are fictional. If there's any basis in reality, they're maybe vaguely related to things that I experienced through my own training. Um, and we'll show that these entrustment decisions that we use in EPAs, they are happening all the time, all the time. Um, we'll ta I'll talk to you a little bit about what um, my experience has been with the EPAs and how that they can complement to milestones and how I think they're more intuitive to use than milestones. Okay, so the definition, and I will, I have to read this. A unit of professional practice defined as tasks or responsibilities to be entrusted to the unsupervised execution by a trainee once he or she has attained sufficient specific competence. Yes, that's a mouthful. To break it down, I think of this as a specific task we allow, um, it is entrusted to a trainee to be done unsupervised once they have reached a level of competence. And that could be you're allowed to start taking call, that could be graduation from residency, or it could be anywhere in between. So there is both the unit of practice, it de defines a practice of a specialty, and is entrusted to a trainee. Now the other thing that we really need to think about is how these fall into milestones. EPAs are not milestones. EPAs are not going to replace milestones, but um, if we think about it, competencies are what we are all trying to achieve during residency training. They are sort of skills, knowledge, or attitudes that describe a physician. The milestones were developed to show you how you can make stepping stones towards those competencies from the start to the end of residency. 
And EPAs, although they overlap with both of these, they are more of a descriptor of the work that we do as physicians, as pathologists, which I think is what makes this a lot more of a concrete um, topic to think about. Okay. So um, what we're going to do first of all is we're actually going to take a moment to try creating an EPA and pathology all together <laughs> here. So I would like you to take a moment to discuss with your neighbor um, what are activities that our pathology residents do um, every day or on different rotations that they should be entrusted to do either at some point in time in their training or upon completion of training. And I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to talk among yourselves and then I'll, be, I'll have you share those answers out with everybody. <coughs> Okay, let's come back together and I'd like to hear about um, some of the things that you all came up with. <coughs> Alright, so sh shout it out. What are some of the things that yeah. you came up with? What are some EPAs in pathology? Take call. Taking call. So it's a really broad one. You might be able to break that down to a couple of different things. What else? Write up a method validation report. Sure, method validation report as a clinical pathologist, knowing how to do that when they're out, when they're out in practice. Opening a uterus and submitting the right sections. Yes, so grossing of a specimen is a very important one, and that's one of the EPAs that we'll be talking about. What else? A tumor board presentation. A tumor board presentation, working with communicating with colleagues. What else? Triaging. Sure, sure, tri maybe triaging on color, triaging specimens that are coming in. Come on, one day, an apheresis or interpreting the apheresis console interpreting a panel, maybe also working on the transfusion reaction would be another one. So great. So these are all, thank you for sharing those. These are all great opportunities that, that we have to sort of um, implement EPAs. So now um, we wanted to, look, I'm going to sort of take an example of one and list what are the different components of an EPA to sort of set up clear expectations. So if you'll excuse me, I'll go with a surgical pathology example of a of the of a gross dissection. So um, a specimen comes into the lab. What are the steps that the resident needs to go through on every specimen in order to gross it? Check the patient name, identification, great. What else? Check the history, maybe knowing what the, clini what the clinical question is. You know, what the, what the organ is and what questions we're going to have to answer. What else? So yeah, inking the skills of actually grossing and dissecting a specimen, um, and then submitting it to different tissue. And so right now we've just set up. What are some very clear expectations of like you just don't get a uterus on your bench and be like, okay, go, you're fine. No, you need to know what the question is. Make sure that it's the right patient. Make sure that labels have been um, checked in and all of those. So those are all different elements, and they really do a nice job of setting up um, the expectations. So the next step is then des deciding how much supervision is required for a trainee to, to perform this task. And um, this is one scale that I really like. It isn't the only scale out there for EPAs, but it starts with observation only. The first time that you're grossing a specimen, you're actually probably going to be watching the PA gross a specimen as you're learning how to do it. And then you're going to have direct supervision with either that PA or a senior resident right by your side reactive supervision, corrective fee correction via feedback, and eventually to independent practice or perhaps teaching others or teaching more junior colleagues. Okay, so that's kind of the framework about what an EPA is, but I don't like just talking about frameworks. I like examples to give me some concrete ideas about what it is. 
So um, I'm going to talk about how we're going to go through a scenario um, about how EPAs can support learning, and this is going to em emphasize how we can set clear expectations and identify opportunities for focused feedback. So this scenario is that we're working with Jill on an interoperative consultation. So Jill's an early PGY2 resident. Um, you're covering the frozen lab with her this morning. You know that she's proactive and very quick to pick up tasks. Um, and an ovarian specimen has arrived in from the frozen lab and she pages you to let you know that it's here. So you walk in, she's in her full PPE garb and she's got the specimen out on the bench. She says, well, Jane Doe is a 56 year old woman with a complex adnexal mass. Um, this is her right ovary and fallopian tube and I've got a printed copy of her history right here. Points over to the table. So you pick that up and you see that Jane, it's Jane Doe, 56 year old. She's had several months of abdominal bloating. The family history knows that her sister and her mother have a history of uh, breast cancer. Her CA125 is elevated and imaging studies showed a complex solid and cystic mass. So the attending, so we're the attending, we ask, well, what do you think the surgeon needs to know in, during this frozen? Jill says, um, well, he probably wants us to classify the tumor. I agree. Tell me what you're seeing there. So Jill has already started slicing into it. She says, I examined the surface and it all looks smooth. Um, as I slice into it, a lot of thick fluid came out. So I'm really worried about a mucinous um, cyst. I'd like to freeze a piece of the cyst lining. And so she's pointing to this area of the, of the cyst lining. You as the attending put some gloves on, examine the specimen. Um, you see a more solid area over here and suggest to Jill, well, let's freeze both of those areas. So she freezes both, she comfortably takes a frozen section slides, stains them, you sit down at the scope together to look at the slides and ask Jill um, what she thinks. Wow, those cells look really ugly. I think this patient has carcinoma. So here's the, oopsies, oopsies, not the right button. So here's, a, here's the, um, the area that Jill froze and here's the area that, that we selected. So you agree with her that it's a carcinoma and render the diagnosis of high-grade carcinoma favor high-grade serous. Um, Jill calls the results back to the operating room with a standard callback procedure. So if you could please chat with your neighbor, do you trust this resident to perform an intraoperative consultation unsupervised? Or you can shout it out. No, no, why not? <laughs> So not now, <coughs> but why not? I can't. I see a hand. Well, I think a lot of it, I know that it's kind of possible to do picture of person. That a lot of people have to balance out the need for a service versus education. Mm-hmm. Gross examination is really essential. It is. It is. Exactly. What are the most essential parts of that grossing? What is the most essential area of that specimen to freeze? And that was the key, the key point here. So if we run through and create an EPA for a frozen section, did she identify the patient in the specimen? Yes. Did she determine the correct method for tissue preparation? She froze it. Yes, that's the correct method. Did she sample tissue appropriately? No. no. Did she prepare slides appropriately? Yes. Did she evaluate the tissue appropriately? She thought it was carcinoma, yes. Did she communicate the results to the surgeon? Yes. Yeah, but she, she called those cells ugly. That's not a good histologic <laughs> Well, that's true. So she's not quite, she wasn't quite all the way there of this really <coughs> patient really has a high grade serous carcinoma, <coughs> but she at least got to carcinoma, which is a really important step at the time of frozen section. So I just want to point out, I'm going to pause here for a moment and point out, we just did an EPA. In less time than it took us to actually run through that scenario, which of course was an abbreviated scenario, we just did an EPA for this pe patient. And it was, it's that simple and straightforward when you really lay, lay out these chunks like this. And so the, now the next question I have for you, what kind of feedback can you give Jill regarding this frozen section? Yes, absolutely, she needs to ask her attending for help, and maybe we can also educate her on how you sample an ovary for frozen section. But I will, I'll sort of take a little aside here. We had somebody coming to our grand rounds last week about feedback, and one of the things that he said was that an optimal ratio of 
positive to <coughs> constructive feedback is four to one. So we just gave her a piece of constructive feedback. Well, what are the other pieces that she can hear? What are the other things that, that, that she knows? I mean, I'd ask her why she decided to sample a piece of this. Sample. Yeah, no, that's a great. To understand what was her thinking process. <coughs> Yeah, no, to understand her thinking process, I think that she might have been misle misled by the sort of the quality of the fluid within the cyst and let it let her down one path, and that was just a very, hopefully that was the only little diagnostic misturn for her. Um, but we also can give her feedback that you did a good job identifying the specimen, taking the sections, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you thought under the slides, we'll talk about ovarian classification in detail, and you did a good job calling that in. That's four pieces of positive to one piece of constructive. So... Um, so just, you know, here's kind of my sort of bare bones EPA for, um, for frozen section. Identifying the specimen, determining how to, how to, how to collect the correct method for tissue preparation, sampling the tissue, preparing the slides, evaluating it, and communicating to the surgeon. So when this is laid out for a resident who hasn't been into the frozen room yet, they're very clear about what are the steps that are necessary to perform an interoperative consultation. And then, as they sort of go through that process and start to get more experience with it, faculty are able to provide very specific feedback along the way about what their performance is. Okay. So, um, any questions about this scenario before we move on to the next one? Yes. I just want to highlight that an important piece here is that we let her get a section in the area she chose, mm -hmm. so she will have something to compare. Absolutely. With. Sometimes when things are rushing, there's no time, you, you just say, no, 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 send me this, and you just move on. Mm -hmm. So they, they miss that piece of what would have happened mm -hmm. if they took that route uh, on their own. Yes, and when we can give the residents that opportunity to learn that, that's incredibly powerful. Yes. And I, and I understand it's a balance with patient care. Um, in a frozen, you know, ex ex section experience, like that's not, maybe not, we don't have time for that, but it's still a great opportunity and we can do it. Another, any other questions at this point? Okay. All right, so the next area I wanna talk about is what entrustment really means and really breaking down what are the different um, components mm -hmm. of trust and strategies for establishing this trust both between the clinician or the attending and the learner. So we're gonna go through four short scenarios for this one. Um, but first, the components of um, trust really are broken down into four ways, and this is where I really love kind of sort of understanding this a little bit better, is that there is competency, there are both knowledge and skills that we have to have, humility, where we recognize our own limitations, reliability, where we can have conscientious and predictable behaviors, and integrity, that we're truthful and benevolent in our practice. So. Um, the first two scenarios are we're going to compare uh, two residents who are um, ordering some immunostains on a case. So the scenario is a 65-year-old man with a lung mass who undergoes a core needle biopsy. The H&E section shows poorly differentiated malignancy. Charlie is a PGY3. He ordered a bunch of IHC on the case, and he's got 10 different uh, slides on the tray. Half of these IHC stains are fairly non-contributory. When you ask him why he ordered so many, he lists a long, unfocused differential um, and said he didn't want to delay patient care by ordering the IHC in two rounds. You sign out the case that same day, so the patient gets good turnaround, but you have to call down to Billy and ask him to reverse a couple of the charges of the slides that you didn't think were contributory um, to the case. Harry is a uh, PGY3. And now he brings this case to discuss with you, and he's read up the patient's history, the radiology, He's got a broad differential coming in to sit with you, um, and he's like, I think my differential might be a little bit too broad, so I wanted to check with you about what to order um, so I don't go wasting too much tissue. You discuss with him and agree on a limited panel of immunohistochemistry stains. They come out the next day, and you're able to make a diagnosis on the case. Okay, so hold those two in your mind for a second. We're going to move on to this scenario part B. Um, these are submitting additional sections. So we have a 45-year-old woman who's going to prophylactic BSO for a germline BRCA mutation to reduce her risk of um, ovarian cancer. Um, you notice that the ovaries and fallopian tubes were not all submitted. So Riley is a PGY1 who grossed the case, and you ask her about the sampling. Why weren't all the ovaries and fallopian tubes in? She's like, I didn't know we had to submit everything. I'll do it this afternoon. Next day, you inquire where the additional sections are, and Riley just smacks her forehead and said, oh my God, I forgot. I had so many other grossing things to do. I'm sorry, I'll get to it today. So this is not the first time that Riley has forgotten such tasks. 
Um, Isabel is a PGY1, and she grossed the case. You ask her about sampling. Um, the ovaries and fallopian tubes look grossly normal. Why do we need to submit anything? She asked, everything she asked. And you talk about how this is a, you know, a risk reduction surgery, and the standard of care is to submit all ovaries and fallopian tubes. So Isabel, um, you, you ask her about where the sections are the next day. They don't because they don't arrive. Isabel insists that she submitted them. You ask the PA to check, and you find the tissue is still in the bucket. Okay, which resident do you trust the most? Charlie, who ordered 10 IHC stains. Harry, who asked about which IHC to order. Riley, who forgot to submit the re remaining tissue. And Isabel, who might have lied about submitting the re remaining tissue. So who do you trust the most? Harry, Harry yes, because he was, he was um, humble and he asked for help when he needed it. So um, why don't you trust the other residents? These are fictional scenarios, guys. They're meant for discussion. <laughs> why don't, why, what's wrong with, what's, what did Charlie do wrong? He did not consult. He didn't consult, but he also came in with a really broad differential. What well, might be another thing that we could tell him about? He needs to read about his cases. Maybe he doesn't have a good enough foundational knowledge about it. Okay, what about Riley? We need to teach her about organizational skills. Absolutely, that'll that'll serve her well. How about Isabel? <laughs> say that. Say that louder. <laughs> We're not getting political today. What about it? Say that a little louder. <coughs> yeah, we need to. We need to. This is almost a professionalism issue, and so you know. Charlie and Riley, we might be able to just have a quick conversation with them about what happened. You know, if this is a recurring pattern for Isabel, that absolutely needs to get bumped up to the program director and possibly conversations about remediation or something like this. So there, are, there's certainly at different levels. It's not to say that you know, um, for these different areas of of trust, um, that th that everything's going to need to be a professionalism issue. But it br it illustrates some of the different points. So. Part of the way that establishing trust in these sort of in these making decisions, um, first of all, you guys all knew on intuition who to trust and who not in these scenarios. Um, and I gave you a little bit of example that some of these people had had multiple encounters where these were starting to become themes. So certainly trust is established over time. And almost each encounter that a resident has with an attending is almost a mini test towards that sort of building of trust. Um, the one of the probably the key things is that long-term experience between a faculty and a trainee is really the best for establishing trust but there also can be this also can be evaluated through standardized encounters so unknown slide sessions and working with the residents to talk through a differential of these sort of teaching cases or also their ca case presentations or discussions that happen um, there also are opportunities for self-assessment and other examinations in establishing trust but really i want to hone in probably the best way to assess trust is a faculty and a trainee working together over long periods of time. Okay. So the last scenario that I want to give is talking about graduated responsibilities. Um, and this is an opportunity to provide ad hoc opportunities where a trainee can practice at a higher level of entrustment. So we are working with Evan on a senior surge path rotation. Now, at my institution, we have a hot seat rotation. And just to give you the example, they are looking at every case that comes out during the day um, and then in the afternoon, they're covering frozen. That's kind of how our hot seat works. So Evan's a PGY-5. He's on our senior surge path rotation. He's focusing on interpreting frozen sections um, in the afternoons. A floor of mouth excision has arrived, complex oriented specimen. So he helps a junior resident orient the specimen um, and select on FOSS margins to freeze. So you and Evan decide that you're gonna review the slides independently and then compare notes. So Evan finds a group of atypical cells. He puts a dot on it for you to review and says, I don't think these are cancer, um, but I'm going to go ask for some deepers on this block just to make sure. When you look at it, you think, okay, these are probably just a little minor salivary gland, but you know, deepers are often really helpful. And so you let him to go ahead and, and move forward with that. And those deeper seconds show that it is a little lobular of a minor salivary gland. Evan makes his interpretations. Um, you sign off on all of them and he calls the results back into the operating room. Do you run, Evan, to trust this interoperative consultation unsupervised? 
I see him nodding heads. Yeah, I think he did a really nice job. He asked for help when he needed it. He knew what he wanted to do for next steps to help him solve the, the question that he had. I think he did a really good job here. Should he be allowed to do all interoperative consultations independently? That's probably going to depend on our experience. I'm seeing some shaking heads. No. So this is one encounter out of probably many towards his training. And so in this scenario, he's done a really nice job, but he knows how to ask for help. So maybe with floor of mouth excisions, he's, he's able to move forward. Um, so uh, those are opportunities that we can kind of provide sort of ad hoc with our residents. So as we kind of review and break down what an EPA is, we talk about um, these different sort of six different steps for the interoperative consultation EPA that really sort of line out the expectations. We have an assessment scale, which sort of was graduated levels of um, activity that the resident might perform with different levels of supervision. Then we talked about how each of these encounters slowly go towards building trust and that trust really does have to do with these four different components um, and that those are the areas where we really want to be able to hone in on. So to review, EPAs can support training, support training by setting clear expectations, creating opportunities for focused feedback, defining the components of trust, competency, humility, reliability, and integrity, and in allowing a, a training to practice at higher levels of entrustment. So now that we have kind of talked about some examples of how EPAs can be used, I'll talk to you a little bit about the practicalities of implementing this in your own program and how we've done it at UVM and how we sort of tie it in with milestones. So just a little bit about us. So we are an APCP program. We have 16 residents. Our surgical pathology rotation where I've implemented <coughs> the EPAs is a, they do everything every day. So they sign out in the morning, gross in the afternoon and preview um, after grossing and in, into the evening. They, um, during the period of that we sort of started implementing this, they were spending one morning each week in the frozen lab. Um, and then our hot seat was, which was that, that senior pathology, senior surge path rotation that Evan was doing covers the frozens in the afternoon. Generally, the resident spends one week with one or two different <coughs> faculty member working with them on a particular service. Um, and then they're evaluated at the end of each week. And that's where this evaluation was implemented. I'll say that the frozen morning, they could work with up to three different faculty um, during that day, and only one of those might be actually given an evaluation. So um, this is one of the issues that uh, actually Scott Anderson asked me to address when I first came on as associate program director, that our residents felt that they were not getting enough feedback on surgical pathology. So my goal was to give the residents timely and specific feedback and then provide data to the clinical competency committee. So this time frame when I started this was probably about December of 2000, November, December of 2017. And just that summer, Cindy McCluskey and the CAP um, Graduate Medical Education Council had published a paper on entrustable professional activities in pathology. So I ran across that paper and it was just like, ah, this is exactly the thing that we can use to give specific feedback and actually map it out to milestones. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So, instituting these at UVM, I combined three of her EPAs, gross dissection, interoperative consultation, and diagnostic report, and added an open comment at the end, and this became our evaluation at the end of the week for all of our residents. It was implemented in January 2018 as a summative evaluation, um, and then I surveyed the residents about how they liked it, and the faculty, um, uh, in June 2018. So at that point, 36 evaluations had been requested by nine different residents, 26 of those had been filled out by a total of 10 different faculty, and I got 10 residents and seven faculty to fill out my survey. So here are some of the, some of the results. Um, so the first question, I wanted this to be timely and specific, so I specifically asked the residents about that. And I wanted to compare both the EPA, and I kind of call that the electronic evaluation because that's what's in new innovations, that's our system, um, and then the verbal feedback that they're maybe getting um, either at the end of the week or throughout the day. And so both residents and faculty um, agreed that they were getting pretty timely and specific verbal feedback. Um, they both agreed that they were getting, uh, the, that they were getting fairly specific um, information from the EPA evaluation. But probably the big discrepancy here was that the faculty thought they were very timely in their evaluations and the resident did not. And we have that data. 
Um, 20, only 25% of these evaluations were completed in the two week period after they were requested. So the residents are right on that one. It's a common issue, it's a common problem. Um, the next question that I really wanted to know was the overall satisfaction with the EPA based evaluation. So it's a five point scale from very satisfied to dissatisfied and then kind of averaging it out. And so the averages were not too bad, um, but I wanted to list what percentage of the faculty and the residents were at least satisfied or very satisfied. And so they were pretty happy with the grossing and diagnostic reporting components of the EPA, but you know, at least a third of the participants in this survey were less than satisfied with the frozen um, inter uh, interoperative consultation EPA. So I think probably one of the things is that um, the first two, grossing and diagnostic reporting, actually aligned much better with our structure rotation. You're working mostly with one faculty all week. They're reviewing your grosses and looking at and going over your sign out reports. And that's the person who was that evaluation was requested of. So that provided an element of longitudinal exposure. And as I said, these frozen mornings, they could be working with three different people and, they, and the person filling out the evaluation might not have actually observed them doing a frozen. So they just didn't have the um, ability to look at that. So we have um, three different, we're partially subspecialized. We have a GI bench, we have a breast <coughs> bench, and then we have a general everything else bench. And we are also subspecialized in our frozen section as well. So if it's a GI case, it goes to the GI attending breast for the breast attending. And then we actually have somebody else who covers all the other frozen. And we just got a neuropathologist, so they're doing their own frozen. Yes. <laughs> okay. So um, some of the survey comments, because let's be honest, the, the comments are usually the most useful. One of the residents said that this new evaluation was much longer, but more comprehens comprehensive and increased the overall um, quality of these evaluations. A couple of faculty commented, one saying that these, this made a lot more sense and that they prefer this to the prior system evaluating specific criteria in the resident level. So I think this is being well received, but we do need a little bit more experience and to make some tweaks around it. So some of the lessons that I learned was that it was really important to align the evaluation with the, gro the structure of the rotation. Um, and that's why the grossing and diagnostic reporting were, were a lot more satisfactory than the frozen EPA. Um, some of the next steps that I really want to look at is, well, first of all, we're actually, we've, we've already changed our frozen rotation from a, a morning to one full week followed by full days. So there's already changes going on there. Um, and, but one of the other things is I want to start pulling out a sort of formative um, ad hoc assessment that each day if a resident is on frozens for that day, that each frozen might get a different little assessment and that those can kind of um, sum up to something, um, a much greater body of um, information. Um, so I did also ask, because I, I wanted these to be really useful for our clinical competency committee, and at this point they hadn't had enough experience with EPAs in their semi-annual reviews, but they did say that they were really desperate for more objective and specific data in order for them to do their job. Okay. So let's move into talking about how these complement milestones. I've already said EPAs are not milestones, they're not going to replace milestones, <laughs> but they do complement each other. So. This might be sort of, you might already know this, but the ACGMEs, they are the cornerstone to competency-based medicine. We do a time-based right now where you're here for four years, but there's a push across the board to start thinking about moving towards competency-based. So that might, you know, not so associate with time. Um, there's six core competencies. These are broken down to even more sub-competencies. And I'm sorry, I, 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 for those of anybody on the milestone community, I get frustrated because I find the milestones really abstract. I just do. Other people have said that in the literature. Now, Milestones 2.0 has come out this fall for comment. I read them. They are a lot better. I like them a lot more. But I think one of the things is patient care and medical knowledge. Those are some of the things that we do every day, and they're a lot easier to grasp. But I, do, I still have trouble grasping some of the other things like um, problem-based learning and, and improvement. So, um, so that's one of the, that's my biggest beef with milestones. I know they're not going to go away, but I would love to be able to make them a little bit more concrete. So what EPAs are able to do is that you're able to map them out to milestones. So we've been talking about this frozen section EPA, and we're able to map it out to different sub-competencies in patient care, medical knowledge, and so on down the line. So now how does that actually practically work? So let's take Jill for example. Here's our, here's our EPA, and we decide to assign her some levels of entrustment. 
and either, you know, I'm sort of giving the scale and I'm saying that, you know, for the most part, she just needed reactor supervision, but I'm giving her a little bit lower level on sampling tissue and evaluating the tissue. We also could give her an overall global assessment of the EPA, and I just sort of suggested maybe that overall for frozen, she's a three. She still needs um, between a two and a three, we could argue about that, direct supervision or reactive supervision. So if this gets entered into either MedHub or New Innovations, whichever your sort of assessment program is, plus another 10 other plus formative assessments, the program can actually map these to milestones, generate some averages, and report out different milestone levels um, across all of the different sub-competencies. Now, I'm not saying this is immediately going to go into the assigned to the ACGME milestones, but perhaps it's at least a starting point for the clinical competency to, c committee to start having conversations about, okay, where is this resident? Where are some areas that they might need to work on? Where are they doing well? Let's see if we can review some of the comments to see about supporting that and make changes as needed. So there is power There is power to do this with the technology of MedHub or new innovations that we have available to us if we take the time to set it up. So there are some drawbacks to EPAs. Um, assessing entrustment, it feels intuitive, but at its very core, it is subjective. You know, deciding who you trust and who you don't trust, there is an element of subjectivity to this. Now, we can have the conversations about what trust means and maybe understand why we trust this person or why, and why we don't trust this other person. Um, and maybe, you know, I, I find myself to be a more of a trusting attending, and I know that some of my colleagues are less trying to trusting and maybe a little bit more skeptical. And that's, you know, there's, there's variability across the way. So ideally, an assessment model should deal with simple objective measures. So that's one of the big drawbacks. Um, there also are impediments to asking, uh, impediments to trust or asking for help. For example, you know, um, there might be a question at stake and the resident feels like they've got a good handle on the question and they don't decide, they don't think that it's a very, you know, high stakes question so they don't consult an attending on it. Or maybe they um, wonder about the approachability or availability of a particular supervisor because let's be honest, you're on call, you get a call in the middle of the night. You don't want to call your attending, but sometimes you really do need to. And there's also attitudes with the residents, that there are some residents who ask for help and ask questions a lot more than other residents who feel more confident. Um, so there's a whole gamut across the board for that. So one of the other big things is, um, and this is comes out from a conversation that we had through the um, EPA working group with Dr. Louis Pangaro. He is the creator of the RIME model of assessment. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but it stands for Reporter, Interpreter, Manager, and Educator. Um, and this is a way to kind of assess, maybe he's using it in medical school of where a medical student is across that continuum. And that, you know, they start as a reporter, you know, as they move into sort of senior levels, interpreter, residents or managers, and so on and so forth. And so he had some really great um, t uh, food for thought. So, the first thing he pointed out is what is the real tool? You know, I've been talking about this checklist, you know, up and down and sideways throughout my whole talk. This is not our tool. This is not our tool. The biggest tool is our faculty who is supervising the resident. The faculty who has direct supervision over the resident and able to use this. And I'm going to give you an example of this because I created another little EPA, very mini one, about gross descriptions, and this was for what we call our bridge month, and this is really an introductory to grossing. Four weeks, you're in the gross room, you have a PA at your shoulder telling you how to grow some of the bread and butter specimens. So it's our introductory, and introductory month, and then they roll right into surgical pathology. So I wanted these residents to make sure, you know, grossing is what you're focusing on. Let's get feedback about it. I made these half sheets that they could, you know, just fill in a couple of different things about it, attach it to the paperwork of the case, it would go to the attending, it would, you know, flag for the attending to read the gross description, get the feedback, and hand it back to the resident. These, these, these completely failed. Three of them got filled out, I think all by me, and part of the problem was, was first of all, it was a white piece of paper against white paperwork, which blended <coughs> in as well as this does on the slide. So number one, I didn't, I, the, my attempting to flag it didn't really work. Number two, I told my faculty that I was doing this, but I didn't train anybody how to use this or what the goals were for this. And so nobody was looking out for it. Nobody would know, really knew how to fill it out other than, other than me. And so those are defi definitely some of the issues. Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, thinking back about it is that 
I wanted to be able to start using this during bridge, but that's when the training wheels are still on. They still have that PA right at their shoulder. Probably the most useful place to use to start implementing them is when they're their first true search path rotation where they are by themselves, not by themselves, but doing acting with more independence. That's the, the, the case where we probably really wanted to get some good feedback on their grosses. So the tool is not the checklist. The tool is the faculty who is supervising the residents. And in order, we have to train our faculty to use this tool. We have to calibrate our faculty to use this tool to ensure consistency and trust. So, you know, I know there's, there's a lot of clinical pathologists here. You know, you bring on a new test, you gotta validate it. You gotta train your techs how to run the test. You've gotta calibrate that test every time you run it over and over and over again. This is no different. It is no different. And that was one of the things that Dr. Pangaro really drove home. Um, and that if you can really train and calibrate this, it ensures trust between the residents and the faculty, the faculty and the clinical competency committee, and then when you go and sit down at that semi-annual review and give those milestones to the resident, there's a lot more trust in that whole process. So the challenge is ahead. So in order to make things reproducible and consistent, there will be a lot of time and effort in calibrating um, and calibrating and training faculty. This, that's gonna, it's probably one of our biggest challenges ahead with the EPA pilot that we are attempting. Um, you know, maintaining what long-term interactions between a supervisor and um, the trainee is really gonna be the best possible assessment. Now, I know at this institution, your residents are at multiple different sites, and that would be, a, that's gonna be a really big barrier as well to making sure that you're still able to train those different people and providing some longitudinal assessment. Um, and then the other thing is that you need multiple observations, especially if you're using this as more of a formative tool. Lots of small observations that kind of call add up to, to a portfolio. But um, there is hope because we surveyed uh, program directors this summer, um, and of the 47 who responded, all of them had heard about EPAs. About 15% of them were somehow using them in a way in their portfolio. Um, but of those who weren't using it, 75% were interested in incorporating this into their residence portfolio. So we've got some enthusiasm there. So lastly, I wanna kind of bring a couple of last um, take home points. So you've seen this before, how EPAs can support training, setting expectations, providing focused feedback, defining the components of trust. It emphasizes direct observation and training and calibrating our faculty. But um, you know, at its core, this is this is a, a feedback tool and an assessment tool. And there was um, in my reading about all of this, I came across this really interesting quote: um, "Assessment is the tail that wags the dog." And I think this is really true. And what it is is that what ass is assessed is what gets taught, and what consequently defines a curriculum. Now. I'm sure that you guys can think about a couple of examples. So our medical students right now, our second year medical students, they're taking step one or have just recently taken step one. I was teaching the GYN course just last month. And how often did I hear, oh, is this on boards? Oh, thanks, that was a great talk. It just got just the points that we needed for boards or, or for, for step one exam. Like, have, you guys have all, you guys teach the medical students, you know that they are thinking about their step one scores. You know, we also have the APC RISE exam. Now in pathology, this is a lower stakes exam and I don't hear people sort of talking about it as much among the residents, um, but I know that's not the case in all training programs. But the big stakes exam is the American Board of Pathology and how I know our fourth years here, I'm sure you guys are ramping up and starting to study for boards and wondering, well, what's on boards? Do I need to know that for boards? Attending saying like that was on my board exam. You're gonna need to know that for boards. And I'll just as a disclaimer, I had like a complete brain dump after my board exam. I do not know what I don't know anything that was on my boards. I don't remember at all. I just I have an amnestic response to all of that. So I want to step back for a moment and think about what is the goal of residency. So we have these fledgling new, freshly graduated doctors who are studying under the umbrella of an academic institution and the supervision of an attending physician with the goal that they will go out into independent practice and be their own attendings and competent pathologists. So if we could use entrustment as a basis of our assessment, shouldn't that provide an opportunity to create, train competent, humble, reliable, and honest residents and isn't that the ideal doctor? So with that, I thank you for your attention and your comments, and I am happy to answer any questions.
Okay, the hand in the back went up first. <laughs> I think that it's less, um, let me think about this just for a minute. Um, so I, I have not sat on a CCC, but I have, you know, I am aware of when residents are not quite advancing at the level that we would maybe like to see them. And I think that one of the biggest, in my experience, my limited experience so far and from, from Dr. Anderson is probably the biggest impediment is that the resident doesn't realize that they're not advancing at the level that they should be. They don't have that information that they're not where they should be or where exactly they should be moving a little bit further along. So I think that this as a tool can provide them with that focused feedback of like, you did this, this, and this, but you still need to work on X. And I think that that is probably gonna be the biggest help in making sure that, the, that they are able to move forward. And, and I'm, if people are moving at a different rate, that's fine. Um, as long as we can sort of get to an appropriate, you know, safe practicing level at the end of residency. But m the biggest thing I've seen is that they just don't, they haven't heard the information because people aren't comfortable putting negative feedback at the, and the comment at the end of it. But I'm hoping that a tool like an EPA up here will be like, you know, give them that specific thing to be like, okay, no, this is the, let's not make it about personalities or anything like that. Like it's about the care. Here is where you need a little bit more work. Ron, well, thank you so much for that talk. I was really looking forward to it. I think we need to have more information about this uh, in our department. And I have a question that relates to something you briefly mentioned. Um, how do you see untrustable EPAs moving us towards complete competency-based training and allowing us to modify the length of training for each person? So how do we use EPAs towards com as a stepping stone towards competency and changing yeah. changing the length of the length of training? So changing the length of training is a big element, which I think is going to be real super duper training. I know that Debbie has worked on this in the um, in the the pediatric population. Um, I think that we have to focus on the smaller steps first, and probably the biggest sort of small the the, the biggest like immediate step that uh, the American Board of Pathology has asked us to work on is. Um, autopsy you know it's not it that's not a time thing but it is like 50 autopsies to sit for the boards but really wanting to move away from that number in order to competent to, for competency and I think that you doing there is an autopsy EPA and I think that perhaps using that format to review you know at least half of the autopsies that a resident is doing will be a huge step towards understanding okay after 40 is this person looking competent Great. Okay. After 50, this person still isn't looking competent. We need to add more numbers on there. And I think there are other ways that I've heard of other programs that have sort of maybe in the sort of their last 10 required autopsies, a resident can, op can do a sort of a, an examination autopsy where they're like, okay, you're going to do it from start to finish and we're going to evaluate you and they have to have three where they have done a complete competent job on that um, in order for them to say that you've done all the autopsies that you so that's, that's a smaller immediate step toward moving away from a time or a specific number in some ways or another, but, um, but I, don't, I, I have not thought about how this is going to move to reducing or extending the time that we spend on, on medical training and, and, and pathology training specifically. But yeah. it's of course, it. nationally, there's a real push to do this because uh, it's very costly to have people in residency training if in fact they would be competent to go out and practice mm -hmm. and vice versa. Yeah. So there's a real push to Yeah, no, and there's a cost. And I think that one of the, the challenges that we face in pathology is that people are doing two, sometimes three fellowships now, right. which I think is too many. 
And um, what, I, what I hope is that as we use these in providing these opportunities for graduated um, experience, such as like the example of Evan, where he could practice interpreting the frozen, that these will help drive to actually get to true graduated responsibility in pathology, which we in pathology don't have at the level as some of our clinicals, the sort of clinical subspecialty counterparts. That's another thing that I would love to see is actual true graduated responsibility in our residents. And I think that will provide them some confidence that maybe they don't need as many fellowships as they think that they do. Mm -hmm. Those who don't ask questions very often because they're confident, there's another facet to that, and that is those who feel they will appear to be inadequate in our eyes if they ask questions, mm -hmm. and it will expose their ignorance. Mm -hmm. And I think we should try to dispel that notion. I agree. It's scary when there are people who don't ask anything, whether it's the technologists or our residents or our colleagues. Mm -hmm. I think that we, they need to learn interaction at a professional level and asking questions opens up more knowledge. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right in that, you know, making sure that there is an environment where people feel safe to ask questions. And it reminds me of one of the things that my mentor in residency training said me, told me at the very beginning of my training, how do I define an expert? An expert is someone who knows what they know and knows what they don't know and is willing to say that or willing to ask questions about that or go to somebody when they know that they don't know an answer. And that really stuck with me and that's something that I find important. To my residents and tell them, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. Let's go look it up. Way back. So, um, thank you first um, so regarding feedback, I always encourage, I mean, as much as it is important for us, for the faculty to provide feedback at the end of the week, also, I think it is important for residents to be proactive and mm -hmm. actually ask for that feedback. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are all kinds of issues, you know, time constraints. Sometimes things may grow perfectly well and faculty may not actually feel like it is necessary to provide feedback. Uh, because everything was excellent, so um, that is not actually what it should happen. So if the faculty overlooks that, the residents should be proactive and ask for it. For yeah, I completely agree with you. And I think that it comes with, there's, there's an element of training in both ways. We've had two people come to our brain round to speak about feedback in the last year to start having some of those conversations. And um, I think that, that <coughs> knowing, knowing how to give good feedback, and it's, it's practice. It's, it's practice. I've, I've learned a lot about this and still when I have to sit down with a resident, I'm still sweating and nervous when I have to give them some, some constructive feedback. It's just practice. Um, but, and you know, your point that it's up to the resident to seek out that feedback. We actually, our evaluations are not automatically generated. It's up to the resident to go into new innovations and request that evaluation of a particular faculty. So we do put it into their hands to say you are in charge of your education and getting this information. Regarding the policy, a policy paper is a little bit deficient, for example, mm -hmm. because the only, I mean, one EPA that is listed is performing an office. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have eight, I think, other EPAs that are detailing, you know, surgical problems mm -hmm. and uh, psychology uh, yes. activities. So, uh, for all of the, like, for example, you have a one EPA that says um, to uh, right uh, proficient, you know, surgical mm -hmm. The same thing should be a separate EPA. You can have one for surgical pathology, that should be one for the right of competent for property. Yeah. Because it is entirely undestructive. Mm -hmm. The purpose of the report is entirely mm -hmm. the yeah. report. So we don't have any well defined EPAs for mm -hmm. Yeah, you get into the point that um, defining the EPA, and so, and I didn't quite get into the sort of the nuts and bolts, but the, the EPA is performing a frozen section or performing an autopsy. And all the other steps underneath that are called knowledge and skill statements. And Cindy McCluskey's autopsy EPA, I do believe there is something about the PAD and the FAD under those knowledge and skill statements. Um, and But having an agreement among the faculty about what those knowledge and skill statements truly should be is another challenge. Um, Diana Kalaus Kal Kal I'm gonna get again. from Dick Kalowski from Yale spoke also about her experience with EPAs at APC Prods this, this summer. 
and she did her frozen section EPA. She said the hardest thing was getting all of our faculty to agree on what those knowledge and skill statements mm -hmm. should be. And so those are other conversations, which is good. If you can engage your faculty, then they've got some teeth in the game in, the, in in understanding about what these things mean. So I think that having those conversations, it's work, it's time, but I think it's going to benefit the residents in the long run. Could you mention just briefly the pilot that you sure. wants to do? Sure. So um, to get interest here. We are absolutely trying to get interest. So with um, Dr. McCluskey, um, she is the chair of an EPA pilot from the APC Prods group, with um, which is both CAP is involved in it and um, the American Board of Pathology. So there's a lot of interest in this. So we selected four of those EPAs that we are looking forward to pilot. And so it's going to be perform an autopsy, perform a frozen section and cooperative consultation, work up a transfusion reaction, or wor work up an adverse reaction in a patient transfused with product, and then interpret a laboratory test. And that last one I think is a little bit nebulous and I push to be like, I'm not a clinical pathologist, but to say like, okay, what is a test? A, a, maybe two tests that residents across the board are going to be interpreting and, and hone in on that. Um, we have vetted those knowledge and skill statements among ex experts at different, uh, each of the working group members' institutions. Um, and then our goal is to recruit people into a pilot. Um, but as we were learning that training these people in these pilots is going to be a really key element of that and how we're going to do that we haven't quite, quite figured out. But that's um, but you'll keep your keep your ear out for some of those things because we will be looking to recruit several people to try this pilot out, see how training works, see what needs to get tweaked along the way. Thank you so much. Thank you.